Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this very kind invitation. And I would also like to congratulate them to conduct such an excellent meeting during these troublesome times. My task today is to take atrial fibrillation to new limits. And these are my disclosures. Um, this is how we diagnose atrial fibrillation on a more or less daily basis. And this is how our patients experience atrial fibrillation, often described as just as, as a thunderstorm, is um, hit by lightning and thunder just out of blue. There is truly a pandemic of atrial fibrillation worldwide. Uh, the numbers uh, vary, but about 44 million people worldwide. Um, a pandemic uh, in comparison to another pandemic which uh, keeps our days busy. There are 22 million active COVID-19 infections. The atrial fibrillation, the prevalence is uh, the highest prevalence confined to the uh, Western world countries. And uh, we know that during the last decades, um, atrial fibrillation has had a substantial growth. And we also know that um, from the, uh, the relation to age is also that there is an exponential relationship, which uh, has also a model in uh, the nature. Um, this was truly the landmark study from Michel Hasseguer, published uh, more than two decades ago. Uh, it revolutionized our understanding of atrial fibrillation, knowing that the sources are really the pulmonary veins, and these need to be the target of our management uh, strategies. So there need to be a trigger coming from the pulmonary veins and a substrate, which is uh, the atria, the size of the human atria, and this giving rise to um, micro reentry circuits and to multiple reentrant wavelets. This uh, recent publication um, showed us why AF begets AF. Um, the irregularly contracting myocytes, they get under stress and releasing pro-fibrotic signaling and cardiac remodeling factors. The myofibroblast is producing collagen, giving rise to fibrosis. And this fibrosis is the base of the um, arrhythmias of the reentry circuits of the enhanced automaticity and the altered conduction, which then in turn um, gives the um, the basis for the irregular cardiomyocyte contraction on the basis of atrial fibrillation and therefore closing this vicious cycle. The vicious cycle is not only confined to um, the structural remodeling, it also happens in contractile modeling and also electrical remodeling. The action potential gets shortened, the wavelength length is shorter and also the effective refractory periods. Um, AF may rather be the consequence rather than the cause of an underlying cardiomyopathy. So there is actually most of the times an occult cardiomyopathy giving rise to atrial fibrillation, giving rise to the substrate change allowing atrial fibrillation. Therefore, in the new guidelines, in the new ESC guidelines of atrial fibrillation of last year, the terminology lone atrial fibrillation is abandoned. It's uh, merely a historical descriptor. These are the guidelines uh, which uh, showed uh, some giving, uh, combining, uh, condensing the new evidences into uh, new guidelines, into new rules for our daily practice. This has already been implemented in uh, 2016 that one should do opportunistic screening by patients above the age of 65 by pulse taking or writing an ECG. The diagnosis is made by a standard 12 lead ECG or single ECG tracing um, over 30 seconds showing uh, irregular heartbeats with no discernible uh, P waves and uh, irregular RR intervals.
there's a multitude of devices out there to actually um, document uh, atrial fibrillation. There are gadgets and uh, different um, variables which are mostly um, meaningful in um, symptomatic atrial fibrillation, which has never been documented and therefore having the chance uh, to be documented when it's not uh, too often the occurrence. So in the new guidelines, uh, there is CC to ABC. What does that mean? The CC is we need to confirm atrial fibrillation in order to make the diagnosis, in order to treat it, the 12-lead ECG or the rhythm strip, as just discussed. And then there need to be the characterization of atrial fibrillation with the 4SAF scheme. What is this 4AF scheme? There's, first of all, the stroke risk which is reflected in the CHATS VESC score. There's the symptom severity, um, which can be measured with the ERA symptom score. There's the severity of AF burden um, being described with paroxysmal, persistent, longstanding, persistent, and permanent AF. There is the substrate severity, which actually can be reflected by different imaging modalities. The treatment tr strategies we have in atrial fibrillation, first of all, aims at improving the prognosis. There is a lifetime risk of atrial fibrillation of a substantial 25%. So screening recommendation over the age of 65 makes sense because this is the exponential uptake in the prevalence of atrial fibrillation. And secondly, there is uh, the aim of improving the symptoms of the patient. The ABC of the atrial fibrillation management, this is first of all to avoid a stroke, to improve the prognosis, to um, avoid this devastating uh, consequence, which uh, is the oral anticoagulation. And in the guidelines, uh, the oral anticoagulation for patients with atrial fibrillation, the NOACs are clearly the preferred um, medication of choice over the vitamin K antagonists, if there's no mechanical heart valve, of course. Um, the second, uh, the B management um, target for uh, atrial fibrillation is better symptom control, rate control or rhythm control. Rhythm, rhythm control, be it cathode ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs. There is a multitude of antiarrhythmic drugs for patients with no structural heart disease. Um, if there is structural heart disease, class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs, flaconide and propofenone are, are indicated. And if there is a heart failure, only amiodarone is left. And of course, in all these different um, comorbidities, uh, catheter ablation is a valid option. So what about the difference, um, rate control and rhythm control? Does it really make a difference? And the AFFIRM trial, which is almost two decades ago, published in the New England Journal, has been cited very, very frequently when uh, talking, when discussing about this issue. There was no difference in this um, historical study, one must say, between rhythm control and rate control in this hardest endpoint here in cumulative mortality. So there was not any advantage of rhythm control. But now, two decades later, uh, last year in the New England Journal um, published the East AF trial. And in the East AF trial, there were 2,000, almost 800 high-risk patients with early AF, meaning less than 12 months since the diagnosis, 135 center, 11 countries, early rhythm control with antiarrhythmic drugs or AF ablation versus uh, usual care. These patients were randomized. Usual care um, rhythm control was only used to mitigate uncontrolled AF-related symptoms. Otherwise, rate control was used. And in this study, there was a clear benefit of early rhythm control versus just rate control, which was highly statistically significant. Um, so in this EAST trial, there was a 28% reduction of cardiovascular mortality, which reached statistical significance. 
35% reduction in stroke, which also reached significance, and 19% reduction of heart failure hospitalization, which did not just reach uh, statistical significance. So this is the rate control versus rhythm control discussion in short, but what about rhythm control? What about interventional, meaning catheter ablation versus medication? When we talk about catheter ablation, we now know we really have to aim for the pulmonary veins. We need to isolate them. The cornerstone of LF ablation is the electrical isolation of the pulmonary veins. The procedural endpoint is to um, isolate the veins, meaning we have, we see here on this lesser catheter, which is positioned in the pulmonary vein, we see the atrial signal and we see the pulmonary vein signal and after ablation, the pulmonary vein spike is gone. Um, we do this with um, a 3D imaging. Um, here is um, a pre a uh, recorded CT image, we cut out the left atrium and then we have an electroanatomical mapping system which can be projected over the uh, map we already made with the CT or with the MRI. And then we can actually point by point conduct this isolation of the pulmonary veins. Um, this is how we do it uh, nowadays. Here we see the ablation line uh, around the pulmonary veins and in green are the positions where we pace from inside the vein and we check if the pulses, uh, the electrical activity goes outside. Um, if it's uh, confined here to the pulmonary vein, meaning the vein is isolated then we have green dots. If there is still uh, any points which are conducting, then they get orange and we have to re-ablate at this spot to finally isolate the vein. Um, the amount of fluoroscopy has been dramatically reduced with the use of uh, 3D imaging systems. Um, one can also do it completely with our fluoroscopy. Um, we can use intracardiac echo to perform the transeptal puncture and then just do the ablation with the uh, electroanatomic image with the 3D imaging. Um, so here we can see the um, projected uh, atrium, which we targeted to ablate. This should be rotating to see actually here the ablation line. This is done completely without uh, fluoroscopy. So one study which uh, attracted amazing attention, uh, which was uh, published two years ago in the JAMA and performed by Doug Pecker. It was the biggest ever done uh, ablation trial with 200 and 200, uh, 2,200 patients being randomized to ablation therapy and to drug therapy. The problem with this Cabana study was that there was a substantial amount of patients having crossovers. And here in the ablation arm, almost 10% of the patients have not been ablated. So the Cabana trial was a, so to speak, neutral trial. There was no um, difference in the symptomatic AF patients, paroxysmal and persistent patients between the drug and the ablation arm in the intention to treat analysis. Looking at the treatment received analysis, but that is, this is not the proper way of analyzing a study, but the treatment received meaning the patients were actually analyzed at this uh, part of treatment, what they actually receive, their be seen in the endpoint primary secondary outcomes, they have um, highly significant um, uh, differences in favoring the ablation. And also, if you look at per protocol, meaning the crossovers were taken out, so it's a little bit of a fairer comparison. Also here, uh, the uh, ablation reached statistical significance in the primary endpoint. But again, the only way to really properly look at a study is the intention to treat, and here it was neutral. What Cabana really told us was uh, that there was a very low event rate in the ablation arm. Um, here, really, the, um, the threatened um, 
the complications like the neurologic compl uh, complications and also cardiac tamponade was here very low, um, below 1%. Also seeing that the uh, drug is not without uh, any problems. And so we can really say that Cabana told us this largest ever randomized multicenter trial that it has AF ablation has a very good safety profile and it's efficient and efficient therapy for rhythm control. In this past year, there was uh, these two studies I would like to share with you, early AF trial, it's cryoablation using um, cryo um, and not radio frequency energy for the treatment, uh, for the initial treatment of uh, atrial fibrillation. 303 patients were randomized to ablation and antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, the primary endpoint was recurrence of AF with documented here with this implantable event recorder, so not missing any AF recurrences. Here ablation was clearly superior to antiarrhythmic drug therapy, uh, statistically significant um, for the patients showing, no, uh, showing less recurrence with the ablation. The other trial was the STOP AF trial, also with cryoballoon techniques for the initial therapy for um, atrial fibrillation. Um, and uh, the STOP AF trial uh, randomized 203 patients in the US um, also, as first-line therapy, the endpoint was acute failure, repeat ablation, and AF recurrence, and also here a substantial benefit of the ablation over the drug therapy, statistically significant. So these two trials, STOP AF and early AAF from 2020, told us that there were significant less AF recurrences in the first year after cryoballoon PVI as first-line therapy versus antiarrhythmic drugs. And again, this is a strategy which was safe, had a low complication risk. So in the guidelines 2020, catheter ablation for PVI after failure of one antiarrhythmic drug um, moved up here to a class one indication, which has still been a 2A in 2016. Um, that was another study which uh, attracted enormous attention in 2018 from Nasir Marouche, catheter ablation uh, for AF patients with heart failure. The inclusion criteria were patients with an EF below 35%, with a near heart class 2 or more, patients who had already a, an ICD or CATD and therefore had um, the monitoring, which was then um, uh, cranked up to home monitoring to really uh, check for recurrences. 3,000 3, patients were, um, were um, uh, had the uh, initial um, eligibility, but then were enrolled only 397 patients. So, um, yeah just a little bit more than 10% to ablation and then co conventional treatment. And as we know, this Castle AF study had with this very hard endpoint, the all-cause mortality had a benefit from the ablation over the conventional treatment, which reached statistical significance. The risk reduction was 47%. The curves diverged after three years. And the patients who were not with such an uh, advanced disease stage, like the uh, ejection fraction still above 25% had particular benefit, and also the, um, the patients which were younger than 65 years of age. So also this was reflected in the new guidelines that catheter ablation has a class one indication when it is suspected, the patient has suspected tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, which has the potential to be reversed. So this is the indication for catheter ablation for symptomatic AF in the new guidelines. So here, as I said, a class one indication for patients with reduced ejection fraction, but also patients with uh, major risk factors, there is a clear indication of catheter ablation. It's to be here, 2A, and for paroxysmal uh, AF uh, patients. So the second uh, 
column of uh, atrial fibrillation treatment, the better symptom control, rate control, rhythm control can be answered in favor to rhythm control. Of course, it should not be at all cost. Uh, the rhythm control strategy should be adjusted to the individual situation for the patients as we always do uh, in medicine. And uh, then the rhythm control there is the option of catheter ablation and uh, versus antiarrhythmic drugs. Sometimes it's a hybrid approach, but catheter ablation clearly has um, has gained importance over these uh, past years. So the C, the last uh, important column of a treatment of atrial fibrillation, which has been a little bit neglected in the previous years or decades, the comorbidities and cardiovascular risk risk factors, being at, um, hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea, obesity, and there's a lot of others. There's a whole mag magnitude of risk factors. Some of them we cannot uh, influence, but the others we can try at least to influence are uh, completely correct for. So modifiable risk factors, um, hypertension, sleep apnea, diabetes, obesity certainly is very difficult uh, to treat lifestyle changes for a patient. We know that it's one of the most difficult uh, therapeutic strategies, but also excessive endurance sport. The overtrained athlete has a higher risk of um, developing atrial fibrillation. Of course, no sports at all. Um, and that uh, has a lot of hazards for cardiovascular risk and also for developing atrial fibrillation. But here these studies have looked at the impact of weight loss um, uh, versus like um, the, the, uh, the normal um, treatment strategy. Um, in patients with atrial fibrillation, the symptom burden score and also the symptom severity score in patients which had a, a risk factor management, including treatment for obesity, clearly had a better outcome, had a less uh, burden of atrial fibrillation. Um, when uh, comparing these two arms and patients. This is an Australian study. The ARREST study looked at a combined treatment for patients undergoing atrial fibrillation ablation in combination with risk factor management. These patients had a clearly better outcome uh, with atrial fibrillation um, catheter ablation than patients where risk factor management uh, was not addressed. So here also the 2020 guidelines show that weight loss is recommended with a class one indication in obese patients because it really can change the atrial fibrillation burden and severity. And this is a clear upgrade from the uh, 2016 guidelines. So what about um, overdoing the, um, the activity, the sports activity, um, like training too much. We know that there has been described a U-curve first when there is low to moderate uh, intensity exercise, also when the, um, the amount of high intensity exercise doesn't exceed 3,000 to 4,000 hours per lifetime. Um, and then there is a reduction in atrial fibrillation occurrence, but if it exceeds these uh, three to 4,000 hours, then there is an increase in atrial fibrillation occurrence. Different studies looked at the outcome with women. Uh, women usually, as we know, are underrepresented in studies, but when we, we look at the female studies here and only women, um, there was no relationship between um, physical exercise and the occurrence of atrial fibrillation. So for this is a paper from Cecilia Linde uh, three years ago, first uh, writing a position papers for these gender differences, which is also a very new tendency really to, to look at the differences which are su substantial between the genders. Um, the males um, for the risk factors are mostly coronary artery disease and heart failure, and they have the U-shaped relationship versus in women, 
uh, women are 10 years older when they um, develop atrial fibrillation. Therefore, there is a male predominance in atrial fibrillation. Women are more likely to have hypertension or valvular heart disease. They are more diagnosed with HEF-PEF. And exercise reduces the risk of atrial fibrillation. There is no such thing as this U-shaped curve in women. At least it has not been shown. So women can actually enjoy the exercise as long as they have time and energy to do it or um, as long as there are not any more studies about women maybe showing also this U-shaped curve. So what is the future of atrial fibrillation? Um, one very interesting study looked at different ECG, a multitude of ECGs, one million ECG uh, is, um, eligible, um, and try to find features on a sinus rhythm ECG predicting that there has been atrial fibrillation in the past. And this uh, turned out to have, have with this art artificial intelligence algorithm had a very high specificity, specificity and sensitivity. So this could really be a strategy in the future when we miss the atrial fibrillation diagnosis uh, on our documented ECG that maybe there are features where we can see that this patient is prone to have atrial fibrillation to actually sense the um, this substrate changes which uh, I've shown at the beginning of the talk. And for catheter ablation, there uh, are a lot of uh, different devices looked upon making catheter ablation easier. Um, they, in the recent years, there have had been a lot of interest at single shot devices, also like the cry balloon, for example, or radio frequency energy, um, having just uh, single shot devices, which uh, shortens the procedure duration. And then uh, there are different energy mod modalities. We showed, uh, we looked at the uh, cryo balloon and uh, radio frequency energy, which is still the standard uh, of uh, the energy source. And in the uh, last HRS meetings last year uh, in 2020, electroporation has been presented as one strategy uh, which uh, has a very good future perspective, at, I, as I would think. Um, this was the first in human trial, having been presented with a very short RF energy time, only 2.5 uh, um, uh, minutes of uh, energy application. The electroporation in comparison to radio frequency and cryo energy, what are the standard sources of uh, ablation um, energies? There are only very short electrical pulses in the range of nanoseconds, and there are nanoscale holes in cellular membrane, and uh, acute necrosis or delayed apoptosis are forming, so that we have the scars which are desired in order to, um, to uh, isolate the pulmonary veins. Um, it's only the myocardium which is most susceptible, so there is no risk of collateral damage. And this is the timing issue and also the um, lesser risk than radiofrequency energy where there is our fear to jeopardize the es esophagus or the phanic nerve. The same is with the cryoballoon ablation here, the phanic nerve, which can get jeopardized. This is not the case in this uh, new electroporation energy source. Well, this is uh, something uh, we might hear from uh, in the future. But as of now, we have this uh, risk factor, this AF management, which comprises of, first of all, anticoagulation, better symptom control, and treating the comorbidities. The management ABC should be as simple as that. And I... Um, I want to also point out that um, it is a, a teamwork of the different disciplines in medicine, the primary care physician, the cardiologist, the electrophysiologist, neurologist, everybody, of course, needs to collaborate and the patient here in the center. I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the questions uh, which uh, we will get in the live session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.